Hayden Hillier Smith is Logan Paul's editor and 2020 Streamy winner for best editor. This video is part two of a two part interview with Hayden. So if you haven't seen part one, go check it out on our channel. In fact, if you like this type of content, please consider subscribing. All right, without any further ado, let's start part two of my interview with Hayden. Can I ask you some nerdy questions? Um, go ahead. I noticed that you detach all of your audio from your clips. Um, why do you do that? And I, I know the answer, I think, um, mm. because I do it too, but so yeah, why do you detach your audio? Do you do that for every single clip? So that's one of the things I do love about Final Cut. You can detach the audio, but it stays it, but it's but it can detach it, but it stays magnetized. Yeah. So it still stays connected to it, but but now I but now I can start extending the audio longer than the video is. Mm. And so I think that but, but what that then means is uh yeah, one of my favorite secrets and I'm very the open secrets is like I J cut everything. The yeah. audio always comes in first mm -hmm. because I kind of believe in that philosophy that if the audio and the visual comes in at the exact same moment, that's too much information to process. Yep. And that actually becomes janky and discombobulating. Yep. I think you even said it yourself. And so everything that I do, audio comes in minimum three frames before the visual. And so, it, yeah, I wow. think, yeah, I do so detach everything for that because of that. And, and you leave those, it can cause um, a rhythm again, like you said, but there are moments where you need to pause and you need to let the, the viewer breathe. I experienced, uh, I did this competition video, I think you saw, but um, it was almost too fast in some cases. And I'm just, I'm trying to figure out how to do this. And I realized like, ah, this is kind of exhausting to watch. Like you need to kind of have this breathe situation where you can do the the j cuts but then there are moments where you just let that clip live like how do you balance that yeah i love that's a great question of how can you maintain something to be fast and decent paced without it being overwhelming mm -hmm. how do you do that that's that's a great question <laughs> i guess it just depends on the story right it depends on what's going on i think I, i'm again i'm thinking about your video breaking down mm -hmm. mr beast's video on the island uh, situation. And I think that's a great ex explanation of how YouTube language is. He, he sets up the premise. I'm giving away my friends an island. The last one to leave gets to keep it. Uh, and then immediately he says, put a coconut in this hole. And the last one who does it is a gone. And within 15 seconds, somebody's already been eliminated. Then he, he's kind of earned our respect because within 15 seconds, he's delivered on the thumbnail and title. And at that point, we're kind of like, oh, okay, I guess he's actually serious. Holy cow. Um, so, I, so I think what's happened there is he has the first 30 seconds is the rule setting, mm. not just not just in story, but also in editing. If he is telling you that within 20 seconds, someone's going to be eliminated, that's already told you what type of video that's going to be. And so the first 30 seconds that you do in terms of presentation now has to be consistent. Because what? Because the moment you stop, you detach yourself from what was presented in those first 30 seconds. Now it feels wrong because your you as a viewer have now had to readjust to what this new type of presentation is. Yeah, and that is how something feels disconnected when there is not a consistency in presentation. And so that's I think that's essentially that's essentially what's happened there is like there is I think the maximum amount of time someone was was not eliminated was a minute and a half. Yeah. That was the maximum amount of time when I analyzed that video, but but that but that's but there was always still a consistency, mm -hmm. and so yeah, I think that's probably what's happened with you is like if something started slow and then got really really fast, that can feel disconnecting, and so yeah. there has to be a yeah. consistency, and as as the same thing, that's what I mean by the rhythm and the fact that I feel like I'm making a music track in Logan's vlogs. That's why that there, there is this constant rhythm because amongst all of the chaos, I've created order. Mm, yeah, and that is how you would present fast-paced YouTube content. Make order out of intentional chaos. So that first thirty seconds of a clip is so fascinating to me because I think that alone may be one of the biggest YouTube language aspects. Because you could almost look at a Casey Neistat vlog and forget the first thirty seconds. And it, it is a, a story of, you know, he's going to rescue his drone or whatever. Mm. And there's an act one, act two, act three. Or a Logan Paul Pokemon card. You know, I want this card. Fly to location. Negotiate with the guy. And he gets it at the end rejoicing. 
act one, act two, act three. But that first 30 seconds is so important to hook people in, to get them to believe in the premise. Have you ever edited the meat of the video and it's solid, but then you're looking at the beginning and it's like, I don't know. I don't, I don't like the intro here. And you guys actually go out and almost, you know, shoot that intro and like to, to fit the edit. Yes. Uh, that literally happened with, well, one of the other creators I work with is Sam and Colby. And I really enjoy working with them because, again, what we talked about earlier, Logan likes uh, short-form content, Sam and Colby are long-form content. And it's the same reason, as I said, where it's, I didn't want to be too much into a niche of skill, and so I didn't have to, so I learned to adapt to Sam and Colby. But when I first drafted their latest video, uh, nothing, ha unfortunately, happened to justify, in the first minute and a half, nothing, not enough happened to justify that first minute and a half. And so when I first dropped, and that was because of what they filmed. Yeah. And so I, I called them up and I said, hey, we actually have a problem here. Uh, this is not engaging enough yet. And so the, we then sat down and we thought about how we were going to do that. And what what essentially happened was, what the, the realization was, the context was not good enough. Mm. The motivation. You've clicked on this video. What is the motivation of Sam and Colby? What is the context of where they are now? That was not there. Yeah. So what did we do? We did the oldest trick in the book. We wrote a voiceover. <laughs> <laughs> we we, we wrote a, a voiceover. Hack. Yeah, it's 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 a great hack. And like, uh, like I actually even had a really interesting discussion with Eric Eric, and he says he hates doing voiceovers. And I'm like, no, they're great because <laughs> you, can, you can tell the story so much faster because of it. Yeah. But but so so we wrote the voiceover, and then we then said, and then I helped them write it of. Where are you guys emotionally? What set up this video? And what are you guys going to do about it? Yeah. Those are the three questions. We wrote that. And now and now that minute and a half that was initially really bad is now amazing <laughs> because the context was set up. And so wow. for me, if, you're, if you want to tell a story, it always has to come down to context and emotional motivation. Yes. And if you can capture those two, in the first 30 seconds or at least or maximum a minute mm -hmm. and that's entertaining enough that people are now uh, invested in being part of that journey you've got yourself your video yeah when i was a freelance creator i did a lot of music videos i am from nashville originally and one of the tricks that i learned was having layers to cut to in the music video yeah. to make it more interesting for example with an artist you'd have the singing performance stuff that's your base layer your mm -hmm. secondary layer would be maybe some trippy green screen motion graphic stuff. And then your third layer would be like some sort of stupid story of boy meets girl, slow-mo, you know, handheld sunset stuff. And then mm -hmm. you just take those three things, splice it together and boom, you got a music video. No big deal. Do you think about that with Logan when he's giving you footage? Do you, when you're doing YouTube videos, do you have almost these different layers in mind like uh, motion graphics, drone shots, uh, B-roll that you maybe either, either pull from story blocks or it's something that they shoot? Or is it pretty linear when you get stuff from him? Like he starts filming at the beginning of the day and then he stops shooting at the end of the day and it's essentially, you can just kind of cut from that in order. Like, is it pretty much linear? So I think there's two things happening. We got the uh, the short form content, the 46 minute vlogs, and then we also got, let's say, the Pokemon vlogs, which were like 10 to 12 minutes or 15 minutes. And those are more interesting stories. So there's two things happening here. To answer on the short form content, um, actually the best, like again, open secret in Logan's vlogs, what you see chronologically wasn't actually chronological on the day. Mm -hmm. uh, we so like he this thing happened, but this thing happened, but something happened here, but this thing over here was actually funnier if I put it here. And what yeah. happened now here is now over here. And so I every I move everything around okay. until what's funnier. And so nothing is actually technically chronological in other lots of Logan's <laughs> vlogs. Yeah. Uh, but I even say with the Pokemon vlogs, yes, I would say there has to be a justified reason as to why I do this drone shot. Or there has to be a justified reason why I would cut to this B-roll. There is a motivation. And so the best thing would then be uh, on the Pokemon vlogs. Uh, when I was going through all of the footage, and I think I even talked about it when I broke down uh, my when I broke down Pokemon vlog, mm -hmm. Logan mentioned the Charizard card a lot. And 
that's like and it and it became for me a telling rather than showing storytelling beat yeah and so what i then did is i then took i with that in mind i used that opportunity to therefore hire someone who made this really mm-hmm. nice 3d motion graphic of uh, a pokemon charizard card and it looks beautiful after you and- tried <laughs> <laughs> yeah, after I tried it. In Blender. But, yeah, but but what that then meant was that then became the justified motivation. Yeah. But what I then did is it characterized the Charizard card. Yeah. So therefore, that is now a character itself. I want to show rather than tell as much as I can. Mm-hmm. And I think that, I, I think I'll, I, I think most filmmakers would love to follow that philosophy. Uh, do yeah. should follow that philosophy. But it's... I think that's kind of where I'm going with this. Of, yeah, yeah. There are many different layers. For me, it's definitely... What happens on screen? And actually, I would say the second is definitely music. That's actually my secret weapon on telling a story. It's, I am so particular on <laughs> what type of music I choose. I don't just go on any music licensing website, find find the first song and call it a day. No, oh, half my day is gone because <laughs> I'm just fine. I find that right yeah. track. It drives me crazy having to look for stuff sometimes. But yeah, I mean, what, is, I what services it. do you use? You use like premium beat, epidemic, I'm going to be list. very... Well, you're pretty much listening there, but I don't want to publicly say it yet because they're not sponsoring me yet. Okay, understood. <laughs> <laughs> but it's one of those three, maybe. Yes, yes. And those are all great sources. And if you don't have the funds, YouTube even has built in uh, some copyright free on the YouTube creator uh, settings or whatever. You can download free stuff there too. Um, yeah, music... Uh, let me ask you this. A lot of people edit with music. Do you edit... Do you add music after you edit the film, just like how a filmmaker would do, where a uh, you know composer comes in and scores the the film that's already edited to the to the edit or what? So um, I would I go through all the footage first, then create a basic idea of how I want the scene to play out, and if the scene does need music, then I'll then find a track. Um, so, but then what kind of what I do then is okay so this scene feels this scene feels energetic but the scene's like kind of sneaky but it's also kind of cool okay there's a three words I'm gonna find it I'm gonna need to find a song that fit, that, that fits the criteria of those three words um, but no I think coming back to it yes no I edit the scene as, as I want it first mm-hmm. find a track that suits what I've cut mm-hmm. and then make the adjustments accordingly if like if, if, if something kind of needs to be on beat then I'll do that but sometimes yeah. but I I actually actively avoid that because that's a very common editing trope cutting to a beat yeah when do you know when to not have music and when to add it because I feel like it's easy to just throw like a chill uh you know a chill vibes mix underneath and just kind of lower the db a little bit and just let it ride like when do you know when to just have raw audio and then when the music is actually serving the story oh i love that question um i think so let's go back to uh let's say my tenet video and you'll see that i used music so uh at right moments and so what it is, there's lots of moments when I speak towards the camera and I don't play a track at all. But then I would do something like, but then there was something this, about this film that I noticed. And then as I say that, do 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 do, some music starts. Uh-huh. And then and then what is it that, that then actually acts as a really nice transitional bridge yeah. that motivates and highlights that specific statement that I say. Mm-hmm. And so I would, I would only have music play when what happens on screen can motivate a cue. Mm. Something has to be said or done uh, in the same way, in the same philosophy as a laugh track, I would say. Here's a joke. Ha, 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 ha. That was the cue. And that's when you then bring in the music. That's the only time I would actually play music is the cue. Okay, so you're you're not afraid to leave the audio just as is if it doesn't need it. I try to find as much... so music and this might just be me being a bit arrogant and egotistical i think music <laughs> is a get out of jail free card for basic editing uh. if you are a good editor you could potentially tell an entire story without music mm-hmm. like but i also kind of disagree with that but that is actually one of my rules how how much can you tell a story how much can you give someone an experience and a feeling without having to use music as your crutch yes and then that 
will, if you keep that in mind, you will learn so much because mu music is a shortcut. Because what it is, like, music is a feeling. And editing and storytelling is a feeling. You are presenting a feeling. Mm -hmm. And if a song already has that feeling, throw it underneath, there you go, you got it. Yeah. That now the visuals work. But if you can create that feeling that a music track has already done for you without yeah. it, there you fucking go. <laughs> I'm sorry if I can't swear on this, but like, like that is... <laughs> I'll bleep it. <laughs> no, I love it. I love it. You're so passionate. I love it. Me too, though. I lo Basically, never use the freaking song if it doesn't serve the story. That's the whole thing. That's the whole point. And it comes down Absolutely. to your whole MO for everything we're saying is what is serving the story? 10, 15 minute long vlogs don't serve the story. Cool. Let's cut it down to six minutes. I don't care. Uh, yeah. You know, the intro isn't good enough. Let's do a voiceover that serves the story now. Boom. There you go. It's constantly changing. And I think a lot of people listening to this may be like, yeah, but I just need to put out a video one once a week. So would it be better for somebody to maybe spend a little extra time and, and make it that perfect story or just kind of do the best you can in camera, do the best you can with what you got and then move on and make another one with those adjustments. I, I think YouTube is one of the best things for, for creators because if it's not perfect, just upload it and move on and, and go, make another one better the next time around. Like what's your philosophy on that? I have contradicting philosophies, actually, and I don't have the exact answer. So, yes, every video you should make kind of should be intentionally, in a, to a degree, sometimes the best video that you make every single time. That's yeah. not going to happen every single time, but you should kind of go in with that intent. Yeah. And then when you keep trying to make the best video every single time, you learn something. Um, but then... Of course, you also need to produce the quantity. And so, of course, you're not going to make the best video every single time. But if you can maintain some, of, some sort of curiosity on how you can mm. make it the best, yeah. as I said, you will learn something small every single time. One of them, on, on that note, um, because since I have started this energy onto the universe of being in this education, I've had many creators come to me and, and they say, how do I make this content better? And I look at them and they say, and they've only got 100 subscribers. Mm. And I say to them, that is amazing because you now don't have an audience to figure out how you want to make your content work. <laughs> yeah. But they want it perfect right out of the gate. You're not going to make it perfect because unfortunately you don't have the experience. And so use yeah. the fact that no one's watching you to make, to figure out what that is. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I think, but also coming back to what you are saying earlier on how can you improve every single time? And this goes back to also again to the philosophy that, me and, that Logan taught me of do not settle. Mm. And the best way to explain this uh, with me personally is I think another experience that I've had recently. So I made a video where I, um, I did some sound redesign of a Batman trailer and it was yeah. great. Uh, unfortunately, fortunately, I actually had some time, and maybe that's something to probably keep in mind as well. I had some time to look back at it at two weeks later and go, actually, how I've motivated this video sucks. Oh. <laughs> and then I was, and then I actually completely refilmed the intro and the outro to motivate it better. Mm. But and so I, I had that opportunity to try again. What does so, what does motivate mean, just in the simple terms for people listening? Oh, oh, actually, ooh. Well, I, I would say motivating in that literal terms, but it is what causes the reason. Mm -hmm. What is the cause of the reason uh, of something to happen? Yeah, so or, you're, you're act one of the story in a way. Yeah, or it's, or I, would, I would even say, uh, let's just say a drill sergeant shouts at you to do 10 push-ups. That was your motive, but he's now shouting at you. So that's your motivation to do ten push-ups because that okay. guy's scary as hell. <laughs> yeah. Or yeah, exactly. you know, it's it's um, so a guy a guy is throwing a fist at you, and so you dodge. The motivation was you don't want to get hit. Yeah. When the motivation is simply the why. Why does this moment exist? Mm. What is the reason for that moment to happen? And that is essentially what motivation is. And I think why and motivation is, I would say is essentially the same word. I think people listening like are gonna be like, man, Hayden really just knows his stuff. And I wanna remind you guys, he's been doing this for years and years and years. You mentioned uh, like, you've been an editor for 10 years now, right? Or, or, or so I would eight say, years? I, 
I like to say professionally for the past four and developing six years from that. Yeah. Of like, I, was, I, I, I had the privilege of, I was doing it while I was still in education. Mm -hmm. uh, and so like it was kind of like a hobby and then it got to a point where I kind of had to take it seriously and which is when I started working for Logan yeah. and then that's what that's what I mean when I started taking taking it more professionally more seriously how did you how did you meet Logan and, and get the job I love this story so settle down <laughs> <laughs> so I so graduated from university uh, as you, as every as every graduate has that identity crisis. Oh God, what do I do now? <laughs> so, I so I then threw out my CV to every single post production or production company that I could find on uh -huh. on on the web, and I landed a job at this Facebook video company. Where basically, you know those videos where it's like the cameras down, and you see this food being made, and yeah. it look, and it's like tasty, and it's like this right? like it's like yeah, it's essentially tasty. I started working for one of those food companies. And okay. also, we also did some other like captioning type stuff where it's like me at the club, like, and it's just some guy falling over. Like, I was making those videos. Oh wow! <laughs> and I, it's work. And so, it's work. It, a, a job is a job is a job is a job. But, however, though, I came out of graduate. I came out with an ego, and I was like, "This is like I'm better than this." It's like. <laughs> It's like oh I'm, I'm I'm oh I'm filming some food videos. This ain't this ain't my jam. I'm making caption videos. off oh, this and so it, again I'm sorry again for swearing, but it got <laughs> to a point. It got to the point where actually me and the boss started batting heads because his ego of being the boss of the company, my ego thinking that I am the I am like top dog, yeah. we started clashing. And so it got to a point where I looked him right in front of the office, go f yourself. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Fired. Fired. Gone. Obviously. That's it. I, I've lost my job. Yeah. But here's the thing, this is the boss that you do not tell to so go f yourself. Yeah. And so word went round, like like r like people start talking about that one kid who told that boss that you do not tell to go f himself. Uh huh. And then, and then one rival company kind of went like like that, like kind of oh that's interesting, and <laughs> happened to know that Logan was looking for an editor. Uh huh. And then so they went to Logan. Hey Logan, did you hear about this kid? Uh, give him a shot at his editing and Logan was like yep that's the kid I want <laughs> <laughs> because of the attitude <laughs> because of the attitude and that's the thing I tell Logan to go F himself every week <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. But it's but but he he could take it he could take it because we're friends and well, it was like but, but again like, every, I encourage everybody to go watch your video with Logan where you break down one of your videos and you can see that that friendship and that kind of back and forth like I think there were parts where you pointed something out and he was like no no what are you talking about that was my idea and then you're like no and then and then he like was like he noticed what you were saying he's like oh yeah 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 okay, no, okay 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 okay. okay. <laughs> Well, it's bottom line. We respect each other. That's what it is. It's That's like, so cool. That's so there, cool. There is no such. I think when it first started, it was a boss boss employee dynamic. But now it's now it's like that. Absolutely, is just we work equally together yeah. on this. Yeah. But it's like I said. It's like I said. I tell him to go f himself. If he if he if he <laughs> if he, he can give feedback on a video and I think it's wrong, I will tell him. <laughs> you know. Do you know any other editors uh, in the space? Like, I I'm just curious. Like, nobody talks about, like, hey, I'm the editor for Mr. Beast. I'm the editor for. I mean, we know PewDiePie's editors. They're kind of like a punchline mm. in his jokes. Like, mm -hmm. do you are you friends with any of these guys? Do you know any of of the other creators editors? And do you guys actually, like have a secret Slack group? <laughs> it's, it's exactly that. We actually have a secret Discord. That's awesome. We do. We do. Well, like, we we all have like it's we we get we give each other feedback. We um wow. We share, we share scenes and we go, hey guys, what do you think about this? Oh, why don't you do this? Why don't you do this? We talk about our clients. We bitch about our clients. Are you joking uh, or are you serious right now? Half joking. <laughs> 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 but it, it's, uh, we, 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 and then also just general stuff about it. Like, like we'll talk about what films we've all been watching. It's just the hub of just us yeah. all in the same pool of jobs mm -hmm. and we just talk about what we're all doing and experiencing <laughs> i would imagine like pewdiepie has got he has two editors now right does mm -hmm. uh yeah so yeah i think that i would imagine that it's a staggered content uh workflow so like one day Pew, uh, you know uh he, he's shooting and then he hands that off to somebody that same day he's shooting someone else's editing and it's just like every other day you're getting that day's content um yeah, I mean, I just imagine it's it's just a cool 
group of guys that like and girls i i hope i hope there's some female creators out there uh, unfortunately not as much females as there should be actually but i, I but i but but that's something that i want to see it's unfortunately as of now as far as i know in my bubble it's kind of a male dominated space but that's actually something that i would i want to improve on well there's plenty of very wildly successful female creators on youtube obviously and um and there's female editors behind those too I want to know them. They're in different niches. You did a great breakdown of, uh, I forget her name, but I, I wasn't familiar with her content. It was a beautiful video. Sophia Nygaard. But it was with that intent. Uh, my, my, my girlfriend, she pointed out that I reacted to Casey Neistat, David Dobrik. I did a Logan Paul video. Free white guys. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, and that's a genuinely, genuinely good point to point out of like, sure. it's, 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 I don't want to just be just like oh I just I'm just talking about white dudes white straight dudes like that's that, it, that's <laughs> well, that's just... a genuine problem that I actually do intend to fix on but yeah. it's and it, and I'm really on that note I'm genuinely disappointed that when I made a Sophia Nygaard video that's my worst performing video because it's well, just well, unfortunately I mean, people... I've already, yeah I've already attracted that white straight male space and it's just like <laughs> sure. I, that's 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 not good that if you, if that's just your audience you need to be diverse and i haven't i haven't figured out that cookie yet uh, but i love that but i know it i'm aware of that problem yeah and one day i hope i'll figure out that problem yeah i mean it's just the space that you happen to fill in that logan I, i'm curious what are his stats on male versus female do you know um not at the top of my mind but it, i think it's safe to assume it's predominantly male what about age uh demographic i know he's probably been going up on terms of age because his uh, his content has matured a lot yeah when during the daily vlogging time it absolutely was just like young teenagers but now it's it's now it's between from young teenagers bottom line to young adult yeah i mean impulsive i have like plenty of friends that i know that watch it um that don't even watch his main channel so i yeah. know that's kind of opened up the door for opportunity too for him exactly <clears throat> um so one of the questions I, I posted on twitter and ama and basically again because everybody who follows me is in the like tech space i think i got the same question like five times uh which is basically I'll read Leron's uh, question, but it's it's the same question that everybody asks me that to ask you. Uh, a vlog has a natural story to it, and it's obviously very entertaining, but how do you edit a talking head how-to video that incorporates storytelling elements to keep viewer engaged? Mm -hmm. I think you're a great person to ask because you get both sides of that. Your, your personal channel is a talking head, education-based channel, and I find them to be extremely entertaining and extremely engaging. Uh, you can do it. So can you share some tips with the people who, who follow me who are probably more in the tech review space on mm. YouTube rather than entertainment? So my two rules that I use when I'm doing my talking head stuff is minimize how the amount of time that it's just straight up talking head. Mm find as many reasons to cut to something else b-roll uh a tutorial anything because and so and so what it genuinely then means is it's actually this kind of goes back oh and the reason why i have that philosophy is again i used to edit documentaries as well and um, one of the one of the one of the uh, methods that i picked up on that is if you need someone to see a really really important line and you cut into a lot to b-roll you and you then cut to him saying that specific important line, that now tells the audiences that's what's important. Wow, yeah. You're right. If you minimize I, that, it really yeah. adds significance to it. I never thought of that. Yeah. And so, and so that's what I, you, you'll see in all of my videos. Like, I try to, not, it can't work 100% of the time, but I try to genuinely minimize how long me talking to the camera is on the screen. Mm. That's one of my biggest rules. But when I am talking to camera, if there is like a 30 seconds, I'm very selective on when I crop in. Yeah. Um, so let's just say, I, here's, here's a statement, here's uh, an escalation of that statement, and here's a conclusion. Mm -hmm. I would do, here's a statement, crop in 10%, here's an escalation of that statement, crop in 40%, here's a conclusion. So yeah. I've actually built that up, one, two, three. Here's yeah. the impactful sentence. Yeah. And so I've actually told you, and so what I've done, I made you, oh, 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 I made yeah. you lean in, literally. 
Yeah, yeah, li- yeah, I've yeah, literally, yeah. I've literally made you lean into the most important statement that I want you to pay attention to. And mm. so there's a constant strategy. And so again, it comes back to the motivating, the why is that cut happening? Why is that crop in happening? Yeah. There is a reason for it to be there. Those are, I would say, my two rules. Is there a third rule? There probably is. I just haven't figured it out yet. <laughs> and are you scripting your, or at least uh, making bullet points or something for your personal videos? I haven't figured out the perfect formula yet. Uh, the first couple of videos I did was completely improvised. Mm-hmm. Um, but the thing with me is um, I haven't perfected my presentation ability yet. And so I stammer a lot. And so there is, with, with, the, with the version that you see on screen, there was 10 takes before I got it right. Sure. And that's very frustrating. And th- I still have that, that same problem. That comes with time, though. You'll, yeah, you'll, it comes yeah. with time. And, I, and so I started scripting. Unfortunately, I have the same problem because what I'm doing is I'm now struggling to memorize what it is I have to say. Mm-hmm. So I think what I'm saying is right now I don't have that answer. I'm finding that out myself. I need to, I was, I'm looking for my little, um, there's this little prompter that, everybody uses called the parrot uh prompter you familiar with that it it mounts i'm not it mounts on front of the lens it just clamps onto the front and you can put Mm -hmm. your phone in it and i use it all the time like i could literally have somebody hand hold a camera like this and the prompter stuck on it and oh wow it's really nice really convenient super easy to use it has a little remote so you can control it or you can use an app that actually listens to your dialogue and scrolls as you say those words which is pretty cool wow i Um, like that and it's the trick is like looking like you're not reading a prompter. That's that's its own skill in of itself. But I don't no, know. I'll take you, practice. If you're interested in that, I could send you a link or whatever. But I would actually would really appreciate that because <laughs> that would half my filming time. Because like half, <laughs> half half of my editing is just cutting out and fl- cutting out the times I flubbed the line. Yeah, I um I did notice though you you do have the standard like YouTube st- uh, format. You you set up the the premise at the beginning, but then you also have a brief explanation of who you are what the channel's about. These are all kind of the things that YouTube educators kind of like love to teach and just talk over and over about. Um, what, you know, where's the value in that for you? Uh, does it, is it different for you versus Logan Paul? Like he doesn't need to like set up who he is at the beginning of every episode. This comes back to Logan's a hack. He breaks every single, he can, he can break every single rule. And so he doesn't need to introduce himself yeah. every time because it's very easy that you will organically subscribe because his content is so interesting mm. with people who are, 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 and again, like you, Logan's such a unique person, but with people who, who, who do kind of have to do the, YouTube standard operation, I, I, I think I'm going to call it, such as me, I do kind of have to introduce myself. And so it's the assumption that um, someone, this is the first time someone has found this video. Yeah. And they click on it. And then um, I now, the worst thing that you can do is they watch that video and don't subscribe. You yeah. have potentially failed as a creator if you do that. I'm, I have to be that brutal about it. Um, and so... I need to give them a reason to subscribe. And so I need to introduce myself. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's kind of why I do that. That's my philosophy do towards you, it. Do you call for a subscription at the beginning? I'm experimenting with that. I've heard, uh, I've heard Jimmy talk about it. He's like, he said, the worst thing you can do is call out for a subscribe because people are watching landscape on their phone. And then you say subscribe, they're going to flip it and then scroll down, hit subscribe. And now there's five other videos that are going to oh. get their attention to click off. So he I didn't think of that. Yeah, That's smart. Isn't that a new Oh, one? Jimmy, there you go again. So Jimmy was talking about, he's like, immersion is so important. You want them to be fully immersed the entire time. That's why he like he hates doing sponsorships because it breaks the immersion. So he's mm-hmm. he tries to integrate those as well as he can. And then he's only asking for a sub at the end. Mm-hmm. But well, I I would again, even say it's because you've earned it. Yeah, and also again, it's just like you just said with Logan Paul. I can't stand it when I'm working with people and they're like, "Yeah, but so and so does this." I'm like, "You can't compare yourself to a 10 million subscriber channel. Like, stop comparing yourself to the top of the top because they've earned it at this point. They they're mm-hmm. in a they're in a completely different league at this point. They don't have to follow these practices per se." Yeah, well, I think it's on on the on the early, on the earlier note. And I come back to that note in a minute. It's Jimmy. I think having a subscribe at the end works because, uh, like, you have now earned that reason for them to subscribe. The only 
risk to that is you're also assuming that everyone who clicks on the video has gotten to that point where there is a exactly. call to action. Yeah, and exactly. so if you can assume that more than 60% of people who clicked on the video don't make it to the end, uh -huh. there's that 60% who are not what well, but then also if they didn't watch that full video they're probably not going to subscribe anyway and so yeah. who do you fo who do you actually focus on do you yeah. focus on the smaller numbers and have that build up over time or do you want to focus on the big numbers who potentially might not be as engaged anyway that's yeah. a big discussion in itself yeah but on your second note then yes mr beast has earned that moment where he does where he kind of can do whatever the hell he wants uh, yeah Eric, he he's at his point where his point we kind of can need to do logan at, has gone to his point but also Logan at the start of his vlogs was telling people to subscribe but now he's earned a point where he doesn't have to do that so yeah. much what about uh, again coming back to what serves the story um, one of the things that stands out to me about Jake and Logan when they were coming up was the merch uh, kind of mm -hmm. almost punchline that it became there there is a business underlying idea of what you're doing how do you play that into your edits? Because, you know, if he has a big merch drop, he's going to want to promote it. Like, how do you integrate that naturally? So the best way to explain it is from my own observations as to how uh, social media and branding have are today and how they got to that point. So when web content first started blowing up, it was so it was an open free market, like oh, like as in um, everyone could do whatever they wanted. And I genuinely remember, and I've forgotten what his creator this was. He made the first, like potentially one of the first ever branded videos I had ever seen. And like yeah, so I did this because X company uh, provided me to do so and paid for me to do so. And I remember everyone lost their minds you sell out how dare you this you're, you're immoral you're like the corporations are now in control of you it like it became such a massive hate wagon with because there's a one of the first ever creators in the uk for it to become branded content and i remember that distinctly and wow. i rem and i think that was a problem for a considerable amount of time and i would even still say it's a problem today uh so what does that mean you need to be self-aware about it. And so the reason why Jake and Logan's uh, merch did so well is because they were self-aware. Instead of hijacking the video of, of a minute of them going, hey, buy my merch, they made it the joke that they were telling you to buy the merch. Yeah. It's so what that then does is an underlying support of them up front and saying, yeah, I know I'm momentarily stopping the video to tell you to buy something, but I know, I know. I'm yeah. sorry for I'm sorry for stopping the video. Buy it's lit yeah. Buy that, that it, it Christmas song. <laughs> it gen it's that's why I was so confused on people hating that song because Jake is really meta. He is more self aware than people <laughs> Jake is so much more self-aware than people actually. Maybe not I so think, today. I think H three uh, had a lot to do yeah. with the anger. Of it, yeah, I, I think that's a whole another conversation for another time. But like, I have my opinions on H three, but that's a whole <laughs> conversation for another time. But I think the best way to summarize it is, uh, people just wanted to hate on Jake. And then H three basically gives them the script of what that hate is, and I yeah. gives them the hate the hate to what that script is. Sure, uh, and I, 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 all and press I is think, good press at some point too. So. I uh, I mean, given one of Logan's most significant moments in his career, I actually disagree. Oh, really? <laughs> <It's> <laughs> That's, like, true. Yeah. That's true. That's <laughs> true. Maybe but, in some okay, some press is really good. Yeah. But so, but I think coming back to the branding thing, yeah, and so that's why that worked so well because actually two things happened there. First was the meta, mm. but then the second was. Logan or Jake would do a, some big stunt or achieve some big goal and then they would go and this is what being a maverick is about and now there's an identity to the branding yep there's there is a, a feeling to the branding you put on that maverick jumper and now you feel like you can go jump off a cliff I really hope someone hasn't otherwise we've responsibility responsible <laughs> for someone dying but yeah. it's like they or that's what also worked about it there was a feeling towards what that merch meant to them Mm -hmm. Rather than saying, oh, buy my merch to support me, it's buy that merch to be a maverick. And then that, their entire MO was what a maverick is. Yeah. And those two things are the two fundamental reasons as to why merch worked so well for them. Yeah, it's a, uh, I forget the book. It's a really famous book about um, how successful branding is similar to like a cult. <laughs> Basically, Ooh. you want people to speak the same language. You want them to have some sort of saying you know the, mm -hmm. the merch is its own like symbol to signify that you're a part of that cult 
Obviously, Absolutely. the word cult has a bad connotation, but it's a cult-like following uh, yes. mentality. One of my favorite uh, moments when I was used to live in London, again, when I was an editor behind the scenes, wasn't very public, was I was seeing... I saw Maverick merch every single day when I was in London, like central London. It was amazing. Wow. And, I, and just seeing it someone. And like the the weirdest bit is uh, I was make I would make be looking at them staring at them like this is cool and then they make eye contact with me. I'm like you know like yeah. and they don't they they, <laughs> because they don't know because they were a young yeah. boy and you're like <laughs> Oh no 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 not in that sense. Oh god no. That's not what I'm saying. But like, <laughs> that is also a problem. But no, but yeah, like people roughly my age but like just being caught yeah, staring yeah. at someone but then it was, but it's like, oh no, that came out so badly. Thank no, no, you for no. pointing that out. <laughs> no, no, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. Yeah, you know. And and then and then actually there was times when I started wearing Maverick merch out in London, and again they didn't know who I was, and that was such a nice moment when I'm walking down, I hear, "Be a Maverick." Yeah. Like, <laughs> like I, and like I, I, and I was like, I don't know who said it, but just hearing that was like that was what made me get it in terms yeah. of feeling and cultness. So like there was an identity towards what Maverick merch was. That had to have been so fun to, to literally be behind the curtain making the videos and, and to see that happening. I mean, that that's like a dream for any editor to be in the, I mean, are you like doing your dream job right now? Are you loving it still? I, yes. Well, I don't think people realize what their dream job is until they get it. Yeah. Because I would have never have thought of this to exist. Ever. Were you going to go the film route, kind of do the Hollywood thing, or, or what was your dream when you got out of university? Um, so to explain that, um, I was training to be an actor on, on the West End stage, uh, which is like uh, London's uh, Broadway. Yes, I think the Broadway. Okay, and, so theater. Yeah, theater. But then the thing is that I had no one to film. Uh, like my acting stuff to then make that happen and so I started filming and I went oh I like this and started going into filming more and then I started sharing it on YouTube but I always did have an intention for me to go to more traditional film but just organically I had more fun on YouTube content than I ever would on film yeah uh the best case the best way to explain it I realized I would stick to YouTube when and I don't have enough experience, to, so I, may, I might need to be corrected on this, but it's safe to assume if I was to edit, uh, let's say Keeping Up With The Kardashians, there will be six, seven other editors on it, yeah. uh, are working on all these different moments, and then I'd send it, or, or go sharing it for feedback, and I'd go through two lawyers, or go through three producers that would then go through five different directors or whatever. Uh, it's too many cooks, yeah. whereas it's me and Logan. That's yeah. it. And that your shooter, it. and your shooter, right? and a shooter, yeah. and so the personal experience yeah. was actually a, another thing that attracted me to YouTube space rather than more just so traditional. Sure. And the most upfront reason actually is I'm uh, I'm paid more than being <laughs> on traditional television. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, the union <laughs> fees will <would, laughs> be insane. Yeah. Yeah. Seriously. Um, I think a lot of people underestimate the uh, the amount of money that can be made on YouTube. I think the the trick that we're playing on uh, that you guys are playing on this like relatability factor of the way it's shot and edited uh, masks the 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 actual monetary value because again it comes back to what you just said. The biggest TV show in the UK, Miss Doctor Who, was getting like a quarter of the views that Logan gets, you know, in the viewer's lifespan. It's insane yeah. how many eyeballs are being manipulated, not manipulated, but are, but are being Wrong. Yeah, brought I understand in. what you're trying to say. Yeah, I understand what you're trying to say. It's just, well, it's that I, you have to be constantly aware of what's the next generation's viewing habits. Yeah. If it, it, it's it like, I, I, I have some cousins and some nephews and I just, I'm actively, as I grow up, there's going to be a point where I'm going to be starting to be out of touch. And so I kind of need to look to them. What are their viewing habits going to be? That's yeah. inevitable. And I don't, and I think the BBC or most TV streaming, like that was the t streaming was their adaption to that. 
Yeah. They Qu- identified. Quibby. Yeah, Quibby. <laughs> Quibby. Oh, no. You that's... should do a Quibby video and why it didn't work. I would love to see a Hayden video on Quibby. I really, really, really want to, but I actually have some personal people who worked on it and I don't oh, no. want to throw them and I don't want to throw them under the bus. <laughs> okay. It's I, I think that's kind of cruel. And like I voiced my opinions to them, but I don't think it's right to do so publicly. Okay, understood. Just like out, out of my respect to them. Cause, it like, is such they... a, it's such a boomer idea of like what to make for Yeah. The kids will love this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like the the people the people I know worked so hard on it. Yeah, and but honestly, even they even even but actually, but deep down, even they knew it was gonna fail. But yeah. they, well, they but they also they, they were also, happy to take the job. They need right? they need the job. They need the <laughs> yeah. That's what it is. They're happy to take the job, and so Here's- it's like. There's a conflict there. There are things that work, though. Like, my wife and I are obsessed with The Bachelor. I don't know if you watch Bachelor, Bachelorette. I have not, no. But there are shows like that that are pulling in pretty big numbers for TV, and they're very successful and very popular. And and there's a, there's a cultural thing behind that. Like, people talk mm. about it. Mandalorian. You, you did a video on Mandalorian. Uh, oh, that's yeah, a, yeah. That's a TV show. That's not a YouTube video, but it's working in this generation. Why is it that we're seeing that happen with shows like Mandalorian, for example? Well, I think because they, they, they're keeping in mind what our viewing habits today is. Uh, so that's why, let's say, Doctor Who is a is a, still a problem because they, they broadcast it... Uh, they, bro- they broadcast it every Saturday or Friday at 6 p.m. Whereas Mandalorian's released, I will want I want to watch it when I want to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's the difference. Um, and so... And, and a bit, but then also... But they the are Mandalor- doing one a week. It's not like they drop them all at once like Netflix mm. does. Yeah, I, actually, on that note, I do love the fact that a Mandalorian has challenged that. And the best way to describe it is, um, if you told me to explain each episode of the Mandalorian season two, I will be able to explain it. If you told me to explain each episode of Stranger Things season three, I wouldn't know because I watched yeah. it all in one sitting. And most of uh, it was in bed, falling asleep halfway into. <laughs> that's actually exactly what it. I think I watched it over a two day period, and I had to rewatch two episodes because I fell asleep watching it. But it's like, yeah. So that's now a whole another conversation. And it's, but I think so that's what I mean, kind of going against what I was saying earlier in terms of TV's viewing habits. I think to clarify that more, I think some television doesn't quite get it yet. But let's yeah. say Disney Plus gets it, Netflix gets it. But there's a different decision, to, clar- to clarify, there's a different decision on when and how you engage in content. YouTube, it's very, I think a lot of people are very much aware of how passively they decide to go on YouTube. Yeah, it's there's a mo there's there, there's a, there's a moment of uh in in between meetings or or I don't know or in between conversation or just in between something is when you go on YouTube. Yeah, you never sit down with the intention to go on YouTube. And so no, YouTube is a distraction service. It distracts you. Mm. Whereas Netflix, you sit down with the intention to watch something on Netflix, and yeah. that's the difference. Yeah. And so Netflix. I so therefore on that note, that's why I actually wouldn't compare streaming television to YouTube because it's actually a completely different realm of how that content comes to you. Yeah, absolutely. I can tell you, just being a parent, like we will sometimes need and uh, like thirty minutes to clean up the kitchen or prepare or whatever, and we'll turn on Blippy. I don't know if you're familiar with mm. him, but like I think he's got over ten billion views now, and like some of those videos like have you know half a billion views on them they're these 30 minute long videos of him going around and like look at this flower you know like it's Mm. literally just for two-year-olds and uh the retention on it must be insane and the repeatability of it like my kids want to watch the same video over and over and over again play Mm. the dinosaur video like even that is a different niche but like you said it's a distraction service it's uh it's the replacement of what Mr. Rogers was for me growing up. You yeah, know? it's exactly in that. In, and even in that sense, yeah, you even, you even answered it yourself where you're cleaning up the kitchen. So it's a passive service. It's mm-hmm. you you watch it passively while you're uh, while you're cleaning up the kitchen. Yeah. I don't like some people do that with some Netflix shows, but that means that means The Office or Friends. Like you can watch those kind of passively. Yeah. But you don't you don't watch you don't watch Stranger Things passively. You don't yeah, watch true. a Mandalorian passively. True. And so that's why that's why actually those types of content make the most money is because it's a hundred percent. It's a hundred percent retention. Because that makes sense. 
you're not connected to it. It's in the background. You're listening to it like a radio show. You throw in four or five ads in it. Yeah. But the problem is, you're on the other side of the kitchen, so you can't be bothered to s- s- press the skip ad. You let it play. Yeah. They're raking in all of the money. That's, <laughs> exactly. That that's that's one of the reasons why that uh, that kids' toy channel is doing so well. Because Ryan's again, Toys reviews. Yeah, Ryan's yeah. Toys. That's a passive. Kids, they don't care when an ad comes up. They don't. They don't even know what the skip <laughs> thing is. But yeah. it's. But then also sponsorship deals and whatnot. But that's why also video podcasts are also the best on YouTube. Is again, you're watching and listening to them passively. Exactly. Like I've I've actually thought that YouTube, especially for my niche, like it does seem to be audio first driven. Like so, I the way I look at it, I did some experiments with my own channel where I didn't even do any B roll and it was just me talking about a camera that I was reviewing. Mm-hmm and barely any music as well and that video actually performed better than some of the videos where i spent like a ton of time on the b-roll uh mm. and I, I noticed people were dropping off anytime there was like a epic b-roll segment and it comes back to like the content is all that really matters is th- mm. the information people are just watching it passively and when uh, in my case people are probably watching it while they're editing or while they're doing other things on their computer it's just off to the side and mm-hmm. so if i'm doing like a b-roll segment they're just scrolling around looking at other suggested videos and they're like oh, i'll watch this instead that's it exactly gives, it gives them a moment to click off and yeah. uh so yeah. i think that's that's exactly it like if you're throwing in the b-roll and nice music and it's nicely polished you're telling audiences that they have to pay attention they mm-hmm. ha- yet that they have to have they have to be highly considerable of mm-hmm. you what engaging but uh, yeah it's exactly that but like you made a video where it was so basic and it tells them that they can watch us passively and they won't miss something and yeah. so they can have it in the background yeah. and it's a completely different view and you and and the results spoke for themselves like that performed better because of it yeah exactly that's that's so it's also i think it does come down to how do you want your audiences to watch your video mm-hmm. i in in logan's sense we want them to watch the full video so it's intense but mm-hmm. like that's a genuine experiment for me. Whereas like I, I do I also want audiences to be a bit more passively engaged. I would like them to be optimized and watching my whole video. Yeah. But I'm actually going to start a second channel where actually I'm going to upload more or less r- raw footage of my like reviews or my uh, yeah. like breakdowns and just have that be a passive product. And so I want an optimized product and a passive yeah. uh, passive product. I noticed it's actually you- an intention. You did two videos. You did an experiment where there was it was like a ten minute version, and then you did the the I think it was like forty five minute breakdown. It was, of- a, it, it was an hour and a half version, and it tanked. It killed my channel for a month. It like it put me in the red in the algorithm, but that was actually my lesson because of it. Mm. Uh, that was what taught me because what happened is I'm giving optimized content. Yeah. They didn't click on this video expecting that, and it was really slow. We chatted for about two hours. There wasn't any cuts. There was lots of pauses because I was stuttering and stammering. And they went, what the fuck is this? And then they just clicked <laughs> off. And so I need to put that content on a different channel, yeah. which gives off the vibe that this is passive content. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And that's I've, I've even that's good to hear that because I just started a podcast channel with this show. Mm-hmm. I, think, I think I may do two channels as well. I'll do like the full one. And then the clips. I mean, we see that with Joe Joe Rogan. Does does mm-hmm. Logan do that too? With Impulsive? yeah, Logan does it as well. Uh, his clips channel gets more views than his main than his main Impulsive channel. Yeah, is it even worth doing? I feel like there are people who consume podcasts on YouTube. It's maybe a smaller audience, but uh, people do passively just watch YouTube videos too. So I guess it's worth having both. It's it's definitely is worth, it definitely is worth having both. I think what it is, uh, it's a highlighted subject. It's, I don't have to, na- if, there is a, if there is one five minute conversation with Joe Rogan and ex guest that I want to know about, I can find it without having to listen to the entire two hour conversation. Yeah. So but that's the, the main, that's the main intention. But then the Joe Rogan fans watch the whole thing anyways, you know? Yeah, so. yeah, exactly. I think, yeah, I hate this, uh, the time limit thing here but i'm starting to fade you're starting to fade Mm -hmm. i feel like we could probably go on for another five hours but um, probably could but like yeah i think my social i'm gonna have a nap after this if i'm honest yeah me too (laughs) me too honestly i there's more to talk about i if you can't sense it in my voice hayden i am so passionate about youtube and i want to figure this out so badly and your content was such a relief to find for me because you were not only telling me things that I didn't know, but you're also confirming things and ideas that I've had over the last couple of months as a YouTuber that 
because I don't have people at your level that are that I'm friends with, I'm not able to like know like I'm I'm sensing that they're doing this, but I need confirmation. And that's I feel like when we first started chatting in this interview, I was trying to get confirmation on. Okay, I notice you guys shoot baked in. Like you know, these mm-hmm. are all things that I've been studying. And uh, it's just been so fun for me to like get to know you on Twitter and then to also do this podcast. So thank you for joining us and for confirming some of the suspicions that I've had about you guys over there at Logan Paul. This has genuinely been one of the best conversations I've had like like in a long time. It's just I, I just <laughs> I honestly if I had a better social battery, I could talk about this all day. Like for, for days at a time, honestly. Well, we'll have to do it again sometime after we both recharge uh, and hopefully the world will go back to normal in the next six months and uh, we can maybe pick up where we left off. But thank you so really much, Aiden, so as well. yeah. for being here. Thank you, so, oh, thank you so much for inviting me. This has been fantastic. It was a pleasure. If you listened all the way here, please subscribe to the YouTube channel. You must be a fan. Enable bell notifications. And thank you again, Hayden, for being on this episode of the Golden Hour Podcast. I'll see you guys next week.